From Hades to Persephone to Hore and the Blue Corn Maiden, let's talk about the seasons and the myths around them. Hello all you funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. Long time no see, how are you? How's life treating you? I hope you are all well. I was away for a bit as I ran out of tea and something something for the soul and without all my types of fuel I cannot function. Good thing I didn't run out of coffee, otherwise the world would have burned. But seriously, I missed you fine people. But let's not waste more time and get to it. If you are a world builder, a GM, a DM, a storyteller, a creator, etc, I am sure you have seasons in your world or, even more interestingly, Perhaps your world is stuck in a certain season. But regardless of how your world functions, I'm curious what's the story behind the changes of the seasons in your world, if there is one, so feel free to share. But if you have trouble coming up with ideas, then hey, you came to the right place. The stories I will be sharing with you can be used right out of the box, so to speak, and be included in your world or can be tweaked to match the style and the theme of your world. If you're not a world builder and only stopped by for the stories, welcome, welcome, I am very glad to have you here and I am sure that the stories I will be sharing with you were not taught to you in school. So I hope you enjoy your stay and learn something new from the stories I will be sharing. And with that, let's talk about what I will be painting today. Today I am continuing my series of painting Adeptus Sororitas. I have seven of these lovely minis and this is number two. For each of them I decided to do something different. For this one in particular I decided to go with speed paints. I based the miniature in black Pebeo acrylic paint and once the base coat was dry I applied the zenithal with Pebeo white directly from above. I am no longer using a paper towel to remove most of the paint from the brushes before I dry brush because a paper towel absorbs most of the acrylic medium leaving behind the dry pigment instead of leaving behind very little paint. This in turn results in a chalky aspect to the zenithal. Depending on the paint you are using, this might be more or less obvious, but I do recommend you use a non-porous surface for removing paint before dry brushing. My plan is to apply a heavy white highlight so that when I come in with speed paint, the difference between the highlights and shadows are very stark. I will go for a stand-up color scheme with the speed paints, but there are some areas for which I will use normal acrylic paints, such as the mask, the crest on the shoulders and any other decorations I can see. Oh, and there are some colors that I'm missing. I don't have them in either speed paint, contrast or express color versions. For these I will use express medium from Vallejo and normal acrylic paint. This will hopefully give me the colors I need. It's the first time I'm using this painting technique and I don't expect the results to be mind-blowing, but I'm very optimistic nonetheless. Before we start our story, let's go through the pre-story checklist. I have some coffee in my mug, I have some lovely, lovely fruit tea in my mousse cup, I have something something for the soul and I have my lovely assistant here with me. This is, as you already know, Potato with a lot of other names. Now, how about you? Are you comfy cozy? Do you have your cat in your lap? Do you also have something tasty to drink on hand? Perfect, then I think it's time for a story. Across the world and across time, people's lives have always been governed by the seasons, even to this day, so it's only natural that the seasons have been embodied and were given human traits across our history. Most of the times, they have been represented as women, but this is not something exclusive. 
This episode will be filled with stories as this is how people explained the seasons throughout time, so why not follow the trend? First, let's talk about why the seasons change according to the Greeks. Okay, so, they believe that the changing of the seasons had to do with Persephone being kidnapped by Hades and taken to the underworld. So, let's talk about our main characters. Let's introduce them. We have Persephone, the goddess of vegetation. We have Demeter, her mother and goddess of agriculture, harvest, food and fertility of the land in general. We have Zeus, Persephone's father, because he is somehow always involved in everything. And we have Hades, the god of the underworld and Zeus's brother, thus Persephone's uncle. The story tells us that Persephone was very, very beautiful and upon seeing her, Hades fell in love. He asked Zeus to permit her abduction as the matter would not even consider her daughter marrying Hades and living in the underworld. Zeus agreed to turn a blind eye for his brother and at one point Persephone was gathering flowers and herbs with Artemis, Pallas and the Oceanids. Nymphs who were associated with springs. While they were gathering flowers, the earth cracked and Hades burst forward, driving his black chariot, grabbed Persephone and took her to the underworld. Demeter, seeing her daughter fail to return, started looking for her. Zeus told her nothing of what has transpired and in her grief, she turned the earth barren and nothing grew. Eventually, Hecate, another goddess, told Demeter that there were witnesses to her daughter's abduction, but none of them knew where the goddess was taken. Both deities went to Apollo, the sun god, and asked him if he saw anything, seeing how the sun shines upon everything. Eventually, reluctant, Apollo told Demeter that her daughter was taken by Hades, who had fallen in love with her and wanted to make her his bride and started trying to sell the idea of Persephone marrying Hades, seeing how he was Zeus's brother and had a realm of his own, etc, etc. But Demeter would hear none of that. She went straight to Zeus and demanded her daughter be returned, otherwise she would leave the earth barren and ensure the death of all humans and other creatures on the face of the earth. Faced with her fury, her threats, the insistence of other deities of the Pantheon and the desperate cries of humans who were starving to death, he forced Hades to return Persephone to her mother. But there was a catch, as there always is. The catch was that she would be returned without any strings attached if she did not taste the food offered in the underworld. This was one of the greatest taboos in the ancient Greek mythology, eating food of the underworld. Hermes was sent to retrieve Persephone and bring her back to Demeter. While Hermes was on his way, Hades convinced Persephone to eat something as she had refused to eat since she was abducted and she was famished. At first, she refused any gesture of kindness from her abductor, but Hades convinced her after he told her that she would shortly be returned to the surface to at least have a few pomegranate seeds. She ate four of them to ease her hunger, but because she tasted food that Hades offered, she was bound to that realm forever. Thus, although she was returned to her mother, she was forced to spend half of the year in the underworld with Hades. At first Demeter would not agree to this and wrath filled her, but she knew that there was nothing she could do as her daughter tasted the food of the underworld. During the months she and Persephone were together, nature blossomed and bloomed and crops ripened, flowers colored the fields and meadows and lambs, I don't know, frolicked in the fields. While Persephone spent time in the underworld with her now husband, Hades, she would grieve and nothing would grow. Springtime was the happiness a mother had at the sight of her daughter as she emerged from the underworld. Summer was the happiness they would share. Autumn was the realization that their time was almost up and was 
characterized by the tears both the matter and Persephone shed, and winter was the pain and longing that the matter felt in the absence of her daughter. This is how the ancient Greeks explained, through stories, the changing of the seasons. It is a pretty interesting idea and, let's be honest, many of the elements of this story could easily be integrated in a fantasy world. Hell, you could even churn out a whole adventure, or even two. Why not a whole campaign around it? First you have the idea of being bound to a realm by eating something offered. This is not unique to the Greeks, nor is it unique to this story. It's found throughout the world, and it can easily be, let's say, a cursed kingdom of the Underdark, where an ancient and wicked ruler would lure lost adventurers to their seemingly haven-like kingdom, a beacon of light in the never-ending darkness of the Underworld, only for the adventurers to remain trapped there, forever guarding the walls of this kingdom if they accepted the ruler's hospitality and ate at their table. Or you could take the story of Persephone, a daughter of a goddess being dragged to the Nine Hells or the Abyss, and a group of adventurers in exchange for promised godly rewards delve in the brutal realm trying to rescue the fallen deity. Or something simpler yet more sinister, the land being struck by famine as all crops fail and the rivers run poisoned. No one knows why or who is behind it, so it's up to a group of desperate individuals, not even adventurers, who cannot simply sit idle and wait for their own death and that of those around them. And this is just off the top of my head. You can take these stories and shape them as you please. Actually, the Greeks certainly did so. Now that we know that the seasons change, at least in theory, given how the world around us is going to shit, and I haven't personally seen snow during the winter holidays since forever, let's talk about the representations of the seasons themselves. But before we do so, let's talk about the miniature for a bit. With the cloth part all painted in Cardinal Purple Express color from Vallejo, it is time to focus on the armor once more. I applied the coat of black contrast, making my own contrast paint using the Express medium from Vallejo, but I feel like I didn't do a proper job and the Express paint didn't cover all that well. For that reason, I'm coming in with some black acrylic ink to darken everything and deepen the shadows. To be honest, I couldn't tell you why I don't have a normal black contrast paint yet, but it's top of my list. Next time I go paint shopping, I'm sure to get at least one contrast paint. Black contrast paint. As I mentioned earlier, if I'm missing a contrast or express color, I will make my own using express medium from Vallejo. I did this besides the armor for the holster as well as I wanted a bright brown. But, in the end I decided to go with a darker Citadel contrast paint, Agaros Dunes, that has a much better coverage. I will keep experimenting with the Express Medium, learn how to properly use it, but for now it kinda defeated me. Looking at the miniature, I feel like it could use another coat of Express Red color, but I want this to be as quick as possible without any extra effort, so I will leave it as it is. Okay, onward with our story. As I mentioned a little earlier, seasons have been personified long ago when humanity was still in its infancy, and we still do so today. So it's not that strange, we haven't changed that much. But let's talk about the Hore, the Greek representations of the seasons. Initially they were the representation of the different times of the year as time progresses, from spring to winter and back to spring. Later on, they were considered deities, goddesses of order, as they were immutable, regardless of what happened or what people desired. Besides being the deities of order and natural justice, they were also the guardians of the gates of Olympus. Just like the Erinese or Furies were the guardians of the city of Dis in the Nine Hells. I have a video on the Furies if you want to find out more, link is right over there. 
So Jorge are regularly mentioned alongside the Carites or the Graces and often collaborate, such as when Aphrodite was born from the sea and the Graces and the Jorge weaved the robes the goddess would wear and adorned them with spring flowers. Now, depending on the age and region, their names and roles varied. Remember that Greece was not a unified single country, but actually a collection of independent city-states, each with their own history, their own traditions, their own rituals and ancestors. Now, in one example, we have the divine trio, Thalo, translated as new shoots or blooming, so spring, Auxo, also translated as the increaser, because under her protection and her patronage, plants would grow, thus summer, and Carpo, translated as to bear fruit or to reap fruit, so basically autumn. What is interesting is that Kione, or snow, so in essence winter, was not part of the divine group of the seasons. This is because the Greeks only recognized three Hore, three seasons. Ah, being a Mediterranean people, no harsh winter, no need to personify it. A second example of seasons, but in the role of goddesses of justice, we have Eunomia, goddess of good order and lawful behavior, Dike, goddess of justice, and Irene, or Irene, goddess of peace. You can easily make paladins follow these deities. You have every element you need for a nice oath. Anyway, these are only two examples of the more common personifications of the seasons, but as I mentioned, depending on the age, the region, and the people, we have multiple variants. As such, in Argos, we only have two Hore, summer and winter, Auxesia, similar to Auxo, and Damia, another name for Carpo. And when it comes to the roles, as you might already know, as time passes, religions change, evolve, basically adapt to, the, to suit the needs of the followers. Initially, the Hore were only the gatekeepers of Olympus, daughters of Zeus and Themis, goddess of law and justice, a titan of old, and thus they were sisters of the Moirai, or the Fates. If you haven't seen that episode, link is right over there. Only later were these entities identified with the seasons. These are legends that the Greeks had from the time of Hesiod, around the 8th, 7th century BCE, and they slowly evolved throughout time. By the 4th century CE, so more than a thousand years later, we have four seasons and they are represented as either four women or four winged kids or cherubs. They are said to have been the children of Helion and Selene, the personification of the sun and of the moon. These four entities were Aer, spring, holding a lamb crowned with spring flowers, and this personification in particular was also linked to the god Mercury. We had Theros, summer, crowned with grains, with a sickle in one hand, and this particular deity is linked to Apollo, the summer god, the sun god, sorry. We have Phtinoporon, Phtinoporon, <laughs> autumn, holding a basket of fruit on her head or bunches of grapes, and she was linked to Bacchus, the god of wine and partying in general. And lastly, we have Caimon, winter, head covered, dressed in warm clothing, with dried fruit in one hand and waterfowl in the other, as they were more abundant in this time of year. She is almost always represented near a dead tree. She was linked to Hercules, perhaps because it required strength to make it through winter, but I'm not sure about that, I just, I just took a guess. As Ovid puts it in his works Metamorphosis, here spring appears with flowery 
chaplets bound here summer in her wheaten garland crowned here autumn the rich trodden grapes besmear and hoary winter shivers in the rear there is also an alternate or better said a separate group of hore that of the hours but you already know the drill that's another story for another time we'll talk more about them when discussing calendars now Although I spoke thus far of the Hore, the seasons were represented in other mythologies too, as you can imagine. But not necessarily were they worshipped separately. Most of the times the passage of seasons was part of another god's portfolio, or only certain aspects of a season were worshipped. Such an example is Flora, the Roman goddess of spring flowers. She was celebrated between the 28th of April and 3rd of May, and then once again on the 23rd of May, um, that being an exclusive, um, as I, if I recall correctly, that was a celebration of roses. She was married to Favonius, or Zephyr, the wind god, and her closest friend was Hercules. The stories around the seasons can easily be transformed into an adventure or a campaign. Think of the courts of the Feyrel. They are the embodiment of the seasons. But what if one of the Archfeys, or more of the Archfeys, decide to take over the Prime Material Realm and throw the seasons out of whack? Or imagine a paladin that swears an oath to Flora. Although a minor deity, she is part of the Wild Mother's entourage. So you have a paladin of the Oath of the Ancients, who took Flora, the goddess of spring flowers, as their patron. That's quite... I like that idea, I think I might include it in my world as well. The only limit to how you use these stories is your imagination, so let it loose. This is only one example. We will continue with a few stories regarding the seasons after we take another look at the miniature. As I mentioned earlier, for a few elements I am going for normal acrylic paints. I mean the mask, the aquila, the fleur de lis and any other imperial insignia I can see. I did not have a varied enough palette of contrast paints or express paints to even attempt to pull this off. and. After I kind of failed with making my own black and brown contrast paints or express paints using the Vallejo Express Medium, I decided to go with the safer route. Corax white as a base, Apothecary white for the shadows and Pebeo white for the highlights make for a very very bright white element. The miniature is turning out better than I expected to be honest. I do need to tidy up the paint job here and there, but nothing too extreme. This is one of the benefits of speed painting or contrast painting or express painting or slap chop in general. The only thing I cannot bring myself to do is to paint the bolter solid silver. I don't know why, I'm sorry, but I just don't see it. Anyway, eventually I will have to paint one of these bolters silver just to see how it looks, but not today. I have three more chances, three more miniatures, but not today. Oh, and I want to buy some metallic contrast paints to round up my collection. Do you find people have any suggestions in terms of brand? Leave your comment down below if you do. Okay, I want to tell you a few stories that explain the changing of seasons, but from a population that I don't talk about nearly enough. The first nations of the Americas. I only found some children's stories, but they are perfect, as children's stories are the foundation to every mythology. It's the easiest way to transmit lore throughout the generations. We have two stories, one about winter and one about autumn, so we'll start with autumn. Why leaves have many colors in autumn, according to the Wiandote nation? For us to understand the characters of the story and the meaning behind it, we need to first understand what the Wiandote nation symbols are. They believe that the world was created on the back of a snapping turtle. 
the tribe hosted and presided councils of tribes and are considered the keepers of the council fire. Their crest is a shield in the shape of a turtle and the 12 points of the shield represent the 12 tribes that make up the nation. Big turtle, little turtle, mud turtle, wolf, bear, beaver, deer, porcupine, striped turtle, highland turtle, snake and hawk. Now for the story. Why the leaves have many colors? In autumn, from the Weandote nation of Oklahoma. The bear was selfish and proud. He often made trouble among the animals of the great council. When he heard that the deer had walked over the rainbow bridge into the skyland, he was angry. I will punish the deer, he said. The bear went to the rainbow bridge. He leaped among its beautiful ways of glowing colors and he came into the skyland. There he found the deer and said to him, This skyland is the home of the little turtle. Why do you come to this land? Why did you not come to meet us in the great council? Why did you not wait until all of the animals come here to live? Then the deer was angry. Only the wolf might ask him such questions. The bear had no right to speak to him like that. The deer said to the bear, you have gone about making trouble among the animals long enough. You shall never do it again. The deer said he would kill the bear. He arched his neck. He tossed his head to show his long sharp horns. The hair along his back stood up. His eyes blazed as if a fire burned in them. He thought to slay the bear with a single stroke of his terrible horns. The bear was not afraid. His claws were very strong. He stood erect for the mighty conflict. His deep growls shook the sky like rolling thunder. The struggle was terrifying and long. The bear was torn by the cruel horns of the deer. When the remaining animals of the great council heard the awful noise, the wolf went up into the sky to stop the dreadful battle. All the animals had to obey the wolf, so the deer turned and ran away when wolf came on the rainbow bridge and the bear fled along the paths of the sky as the deer ran the blood of the bear dropped from his horns and it fell down on the lower world and made the leaves of the trees many colors some were red some were yellow some were brown some were scarlet and some were crimson and now each year when the autumn comes the leaves of the trees take to those many colors the forests are flooded with soft and glowing beauty. Then the Wyandets say that the blood of the bear has again been thrown down from the sky upon the trees of the great island. This is a very interesting story and you can glean some of the beliefs that the Wyandets nation have about the heaven, the animals, the rainbow, the world around them in general. Oh, and please excuse me if I butchered the name. Okay, now... Let's move to the winter story. This one comes from the Pueblo people. Blue Corn Maiden and the Coming of Winter, an Akoma legend. Blue Corn Maiden was the prettiest of the Corn Maiden sisters. The Pueblo people loved her very much and loved the delicious blue corn that she gave them all year long. Not only was Blue Corn Maiden beautiful, but she was also very gentle and had a kind spirit. She brought peace and happiness to the people of the Pueblos. One cold winter day, the maiden went out to gather firewood. This was something that she wouldn't normally do. While she was out of her abode, she saw Winter Katsina. Winter Katsina is the spirit who brings winter to the earth. He wore his blue and white mask and blew cold wind with his breath. But when Winter Katsina saw Blue Corn Maiden, he fell in love. He invited her to come to his house and she went with him. Inside his house, he blocked the windows with ice and the doorway with snow and made Blue Corn Maiden his prisoner. Although Winter Katsina was very kind and gentle to Blue Corn Maiden and loved her very, very much, she was very sad because of the fact that she was a prisoner. She was sad because she had to live with him. She wanted to go back to her own home and make the blue corn grow for the people of the Pueblos. 
Winter Katsina went out one day to do his duties and blow cold wind upon the earth and scatter snow over the mesas and the valleys. While he was gone, Blue Corn Maiden pushed the snow away from the doorway and went out of the house to look for the plants and foods she loved to find in summer. Under all the ice and snow, all she found was four blades of yucca. She took the yucca back to Winter Katsima's home and started a fire. Winter Katsina would never allow her to start a fire when he was in the house. When the fire was started, the snow in the doorway fell away and in walked Summer Katsina. Summer Katsina carried in one hand fresh corn and in the other many blades of yucca. He came towards his friend Blue Corn Maiden. Just then, Winter Katsina stormed through the doorway followed by a roar of winter wind. Winter Katsina carried an icicle in his right hand, which he held like a flint knife, and a ball of ice in his left hand, which he wielded like a hand axe. It looked like Winter Katsina intended to fight Summer Katsina. As Winter Katsina blew a blast of cold air, Summer Katsina blew a warm breeze. When Winter Katsina raised his icicle knife, Summer Katsina raised his model of yucca leaves and they caught fire. The fire melted the icicle, and Winter Katsina saw that he needed to make peace with Summer Katsina, not war, lest he was defeated. The two sat and talked. They agreed that Blue Corn Maiden would live among the people of the Pueblos and give them her blue corn only half of the year, in the time of Summer Katsina. The other half of the year, Blue Corn Maiden would live with Winter Katsina and the people would have no corn. Blue Corn Maiden went away with Summer Katsina and he was kind to her. She became the sign of springtime, eagerly awaited by the people. Sometimes, when spring has come already, Winter Katsina would blow cold wind suddenly or scatter snow, although his time has passed. He does this just to show how displeased he is to have given up Blue Corn Maiden for half of the year. As you can see, the theme of the story is quite similar to that of Demeter, Persephone and Hades. This goes to show that the stories that make us human are somewhat universal. Again, these are stories that can easily be integrated in any fantasy setting, made into adventures or even campaigns. Now, let's wrap things up. Even to this day, people personify the seasons and give them human traits. Moreover, since times immemorial, even the human life has been divided in seasons. During the spring of our lives, we are children and adolescents and learn, we grow, we mature. During summer, we are young adults, full of strength, of life, of drive. During autumn, we are wise adults who start slowing down and enjoying life, enjoying the fruits of our labor. And in our winter, we are older. We slow down and take it really easy, waiting for the next adventure. I'm curious, in your culture, in your mythology, are there stories about the seasons? Leave a comment down below if you want to share and inspire me and others with your stories. And with that, I believe there is enough material here to enhance your world, if not even write a whole campaign around the seasons, or around the story of Persephone, Hades and the Matter, or around the Blue Corn Maiden and the Summer and Winter Katsinas. Now, if you enjoyed this video and found value in it, please make sure you like. This shows me that it was somewhat useful. Subscribe and join this growing funky community. Hit the bell so you are notified when the next video is out and share it with your friends, your DMs, GMs, storytellers, creators, players, neighbors, family, pets, everybody. Oh, and if you want to see more of my lovely assistants, make sure you check out twcreative-cats, a channel with shorts that have nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. Oh, and Patito's seventh name and part of her first title is Defiance. Now, thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today. And I can't wait to see you all funky people here on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of mini painting, history, world building and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and 
Never stop world building and creating amazing things, whatever those are. Your mind and imaginations are awesome and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers.